Welcome to The Journey. I'm Julianne Hartman, and I'm so glad that you guys are with us today. So this is part three of the Virginia Croy story, which is pretty amazing. I mean, honestly, it's it's got me just like shocked at the things that I'm hearing. I feel like I'm watching it in a movie, but you know, movies are based on true stories anyway, most of when you hear those kind of things. So um, it's it's a foreign world to me. And so I'm so thankful, Virginia, that you're here and you're talking about it. You're being open about everything. And I love that because when we expose the lies of the enemy, there's nothing but freedom to catch us. So thank you so much for joining me again for episode three. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. And I believe what you said, that we need to be set free. And I'm so thankful for what God has done for me. And and bringing me out and bringing me into light when I was in such darkness and I had no clue. I had no idea. And, and it's that, just been years. That's what's just so, so weird to me that you had no idea. I mean, and the world that we live in today, now I've only lived in LA, like I only know this part of Southern California, um, but I don't, I just can't even imagine uh, just not knowing, right? So you didn't know what you didn't know, like you didn't know, which is so bizarre. But anyway, let's get back into your story. So now you've met your husband. You said his name is Richard, correct? Yeah. Okay. So you met Richard. And so you guys, how long was your, your dating period? Or do you guys get married right away? Uh, no, we, we dated about a year. Well, actually, it was two years after I met him that we ended up getting married. Um, so because we didn't start dating right away. He just was a friend. And um, then we we dated about a year and then we got married. Okay. And so did you have kids right away? I did. Uh, we had a, a boy. Uh, and then 22 months later, I had a little girl. And, and now then, your husband was a part of that church. So you guys had the same belief. Yes. Yeah. All right. Now, was he, I mean, did... Was was he like even stronger in it than you were or, you know, more strict in it uh, or who was more strict in there? Oh, I was the strict one. <laughs> yeah, he was loose, as my mother would say. <laughs> he listened to the radio. He he actually took medicine, which I never had a pill in my life. And so that was hard for me because I didn't know till after we were married. But he did things, you know, that weren't right or what the church wouldn't have have approved of even growing up like his family was very lax they okay. did. his family was a part of the church as well yeah mm -hmm. and but he told me after we got married that they had a tv but if the pastor came over they would run the tv up to the third floor and hide it <laughs> until after the pastor left <laughs> so so see they lived a double life isn't that crazy that we exalt man oh my yeah. god you know, you know, what's really crazy. They feared the pastor more than they did God. There was no fear of God because the church actually taught you deception because if you could get away with it, like they would try things. And when you got away with it, nothing happened. God didn't strike them. Then they continued, but it was as long as the pastor didn't know. Isn't that crazy? That is so crazy, but it's so true. And you know, I, uh, my husband and I were pastors and that's one thing that I've always been so clear about, like, don't not do something because I'm around, like I'm a human, like all we're doing is yes, we are shepherding a flock, but we're just telling you what Jesus said. You do your own thing. You decide whatever, if you want to do whatever it is in your life that you do, that's, you know, of course I'm, I'm going to lead and guide you into truth, but I'm not a dictator. And I don't want you to feel like, well, don't let, you know, when, don't let Butch and Julianne here. And the reason why I say that too, is because I was a fitness instructor and everybody would always be afraid if I came to the party because I did eat very healthy. I just prefer eating healthy. So when someone would eat something bad, you know, they'd be like, oh, don't let Julianne see you. would be like, why? You know, I don't care. It's like, yeah. It's not my business whether you eat cake or not. Like, who cares about that? But I think just as a as a, as humans, we tend to do that. Yeah. We someone that we has do. that sits in an authoritative position, you know, has that authority, and that we can't look bad in the sight of 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 man, which is horrible because we know that a fear of man brings a snare. 
And that is just awful. So I've, I've never been, I've never lived my life that way, even though I didn't know that, but I've never lived my life that way that I feared man over God, never, ever, ever. So, so you meet your husband, you guys are doing good. You have two kids. And so um, you said that you had appendicitis and that was that between the, the two kids or was it after the kids? It was after my second child. The, okay. Uh, and then I had it. Uh, and then when I started getting better, um, I got my children back. And, you know, life just went on. But now it went on as normal to anyone looking on. But now in my head, there is a difference because now I was seeking God. Okay, so I have a question about that. So you're saying that your appendix ruptured. Yes. And you, so you had all the toxins in you. You definitely yes. could have died. That is for sure. Yes. Um, our, my, my daughter had her appendix rupture. And so, you know, she had a drain for like two weeks out of, you know, in her trying to drain out all the toxic waste. So you look out, I mean, that's pretty amazing. So I know you said it was a couple weeks and you were just bent over. Did you? It ever, was months. Oh, months. Okay. So it was months. Yes. So at any point, did you be like, were you like, oh my gosh, someone needs to take me to the hospital? Or was that not even no. a, a consideration? Oh, no. no, that it was actually, ex, um, uh, I don't know what word to use, but it was a good thing because if I would have went to the hospital, I would have went to hell. Okay, gosh. I would have rather died because <laughs> I wanted to go to heaven. You want you rather die in the will of God than go to the hospital and die. Yes, absolutely. Got it. Absolutely. So the hospital wasn't even a a thought, an option, not once. Uh, It just, you had such fear of that. Yeah. Does anybody in the church know that you were dealing with this? Was anybody coming over and? Yes. uh, Some women in the church would come every day. They would, uh, my husband would go off to work and they would feed me and they would take care of me. And most of them would sit there till an hour before my husband would come home. And they'd say, well, he'll be home within an hour. So I'm leaving. I have to go home, make supper for my husband. Cause that was the other strict thing. Every woman had to have supper on the table when her husband come home. That was, that, oh, I, was that was an obedient, good wife. I would have been kicked out of the church big time just based <laughs> on that. <laughs> so uh yeah so they would leave and then my husband come in and take over for, you know and take care of me uh but i have a question about about your religious organization what about um like you know many wives i mean was it was it just one uh, wife or could men oh, have many wives no, one wife okay well at least they they stuck to yeah. that <laughs> yeah they did it yeah they did that but uh but the children so sad because they took the abuse so many of them mm. from the parents abuse so, is the, the uh, religious re- abuse and physical abuse as well physical absolutely yeah we found that out af- after i left i started and so many people started leaving and then they start opening up and sharing and telling what happened in the homes and then i saw why my mother was so strict with us and why she didn't let us go into other homes because she knew of that but the church did nothing because they hid everything they would never think of going to the authorities because like, okay you, can you can you expand on that a little bit with like what what was going on what kind of abuse was it because they were disobedient because they no sexual ah uh, yeah sexual abuse between and, siblings that and the parents to the oh my to, to the children absolutely oh my yeah you know i have heard that when you know these kind of organizations that families belong to like and I, i'm not saying church because that's not even a church no. where they're they don't they just they don't know any better and they start you know sexual thing they start doing sexual things to their brothers and sisters and not realizing that yeah. they're not supposed to do that which that's just beyond. I I and can't. That's disgusting. It's so sad because he, here's what separating yourself from the world did. We were told we had to be separated from the world because that's the world was sin, 
and we kept ourselves pure for the Lord, not knowing that we were worse. Because when you separate yourself, God said we're to live with one another. We're, it's not to be that separation. Separation is the devil's ploy to keep the sin in. And because everybody was afraid to go to the authorities, it just grew rampant. Everybody knew nobody would turn each other in. Oh. It was just a secret. Do you understand? I, yeah, I do. Secret. And it was something you didn't talk about. So when somebody would get bold enough to come to the pastors, they put it under the rug and they hid it because you didn't say anything. Mm. I, I don't understand that, except that that's a big ploy of Satan. Well, yeah, but it's a controlling thing because the pastors are, you know, the pastors are God, obviously, or they, they think they are, or they've been revered as that. They, the, the congregation yeah. has taught that. Gosh, and, do you have a and, picture, and if have a picture of those pastors? I'm just curious what they look like. <laughs> just normal men. <laughs> but here, here's the thing. If they would have addressed that, then they would have lost control of the church. Yeah. Because see, they had to keep control by saying everything's perfect. Because well, if you were really going on in their house too. I wonder. Yeah. I do. Okay. And then you see, you know, it's like when these kids get out of that, they grow up and they see like, what the heck was that? You know, they run from God. They don't, they're afraid except you. You didn't run from him. You actually went to him. So maybe you can start talking about how that transition started happening. Yeah, it it, it started happening when I got sick after I was married uh, and that my appendix burst and I wanted to get well. I just wanted my children back. I didn't understand. And I wanted to walk again. I wanted to take care of my children. And I truly believed I don't know how I got this concept, but I truly believe that God didn't give me those children only to rip me away from them. See, we were taught in a church that if you got sick and you died, that was God's will. But I guess that was one thing I couldn't grasp. So I was fighting to get well, to get my children back. Even to the point of like, God, if you're there, I would literally put my fist to the ceiling. God, do you exist? You know, if you're there, show me. Um, and he did. He started showing me. So it was uh, now a quest to to find him, to walk with him. And I wouldn't listen to anything but that voice I heard in my living room. And that voice started talking to me. It was incredible and amazing. But I would only listen to that voice. I didn't care who talked to me because I trusted no one now. When I found out that I was lied to all my life, being told I was going to heaven, to wake up and find out I wasn't not only not going to heaven, I was heading in the opposite direction. <laughs> and God had to turn me around. It was, it was exciting to me. Um, it was all, I was just in all that God would care that much about me. So then you started now. Okay. So you started reading the word and then the Holy spirit would speak to you through the word. I know that you did find Andrew. Maybe you can tell us about how you found Andrew. Um, again, it also wasn't you talked about another person that was on the radio. Do you remember who that was? And they were talking to you about Jesus, right? Yes. Uh, there was a lineup. So it was, there was two of them that I remember very well. And one was Charles Stanley and one was Adrian Rogers. And, and I would hear those two in the morning. And I always prayed that my husband wouldn't turn that dial on that <laughs> radio. Cause I didn't want him to know I was listening to this. Cause that would have been, I'd have gotten in trouble. Okay, so quick, really quick, when you said you would have gotten in trouble, what would he have done? Yelled at well, he would have told his parents and it would have escalated into a big thing that I'm listening to another preacher. And oh, you know wow. that that was that was more serious than them listening to a baseball game, even though that was to, we were told that was sin. You didn't listen to any other teaching. That was even worse. You were really going to hell because you were really listening to a false doctrine. So I started, uh, I just know one day I was out at a yard sale and there was this broken TV there. And the guy said he was just putting it out for parts. It said free. And I said, do you think it would work to show movies? I want to show movies to my son. And uh, and I was being bold then because that I was-, was say, Are you allowed to show movies? No, <laughs> no. 
<laughs> so, uh, but I had little nature movies and things. And so he said, just take it. And if it doesn't work, just throw it away. So I would always put the movies in first because I didn't like the white sound of the TV when I turn it on. So I put the movie in, then I turn the TV on. And it, and it worked to do that, but it worked for nothing else. You couldn't get anything else in that TV. But one day, for whatever reason, except for God, <laughs> I turned the TV on first before I stuck the movie in. And this guy's talking. There was no picture, just a voice as clear as you and I are talking now. And he was talking about Jesus and that he wants you well. And I was so mesmerized. I quick grabbed tape and put it over my son's movie and stuck it in and recorded I just recorded right over his little nature tape. <laughs> and I, and then when I put him to nap that day, because this was like 10 o'clock in the morning when I put him to nap, I went down and put that tape back in there. I started listening and it was like, wow. I, and I just did it every day. I started taping up his, his movies. I tape, put tape over the holes and record over them just so I could hear this man speak. And then after that, nothing on the TV. It was over. It was, it was just him. And that's how God started feeding me truth. Okay. So question, what year was that? Uh, that would have been 2000, I guess. Okay. But yeah. didn't you have to have cable? Before that. Didn't you have to have cable or something to get? That, we didn't have any. Thing. that's the weird thing What's so bizarre about this whole story that you're being a rebel you brought a tv in your house yeah. and somehow some way andrew womack is on your tv yes that's absolutely incredible it is, is it, it's mind-boggling actually and and we're like how did we get him and later after we had moved from that neighborhood because very shortly after that we moved, um, we had gone back years later to show the children where we lived, where they were born. And we saw that the neighbors had a disc. So I'm assuming that maybe it was picking up Andrew off the disc. Oh. TV, but why didn't it get anything else? <laughs> if it was, wouldn't it pick something else up? I don't yeah, know. But when God's trying to get something to you, he will, he he will, will. get it to you. Oh my gosh. Okay. So now did you feel like you were like cheating on the, the, the church cheating on your husband? No, your, no how, I how felt like handling this? I, I, I was angry. I went through a very bit of good bit of anger because I felt the church cheated me. They did. They did. They cheated me of my life. They cheated me of everything. And everything I believed in, I felt like I had hit rock bottom and I had to start my life all over again. But, but as God fed me, I, I started to be grateful that he called me when he did that I could give my children a life, but I didn't know how to get out of there. So I was always angry because, because my husband had such a hold on me. I had no place to go. And he had threatened me if I leave because he got mad at this Jesus thing. He'd go, Jesus, Jesus, I hate it. Don't ever say that name. And one thing that puzzled me was we always sang about Jesus in church. They talked about Jesus. They talked about the cross. But it wasn't until I come fully out of there that God showed me that the Jesus in our church, or like you say, cult, uh, the Jesus there was their man-made Jesus. He wasn't God. There was no power. But now I'm speaking Jesus. I was speaking the power. There was power in that name because now I understood who he was. I didn't understand at the time. It wasn't two years later God showed me that. That's what was aggravating my husband. Because I couldn't understand. <laughs> he spoke the name of Jesus every Sunday when he sang the hymns. And so the Lord showed me the difference. We made our own Jesus in that church. He was not God. He was just, uh, the pastor would say, because people would come who were understanding and would leave the church. They'd come and back to the pastor and say, what do you do with, uh, a son will be born and his name will be everlasting father, prince of peace, counselor, you know, et cetera. And he said they were only names that God would give Jesus while he was on this earth, just so he had power on the earth. And that was not Jesus. So, 
So they had an excuse for everything. Of course. So they read the word, but they twisted it when they spoke uh, the the meaning of it. Absolutely. So now, yeah. what? How was now the friction between you and your husband? Because you're 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 discovering all this. You're a little angry, um, and he's yeah. not budging, right? Oh uh, no, he he had threatened me that he was going to take me to a divorce court, and that he would win hands down. He'd take the children, and I would never see them again because. He said, you can't work, you can't drive, you can't see. He said, the mother usually gets the children, but I'll win hands down because you're incapable of anything, of taking care of them properly. So I stayed and kept going to church because I was so afraid of losing my children. Yeah. But well, on Sundays, sometimes when they were speaking over the pulpit, I, I like, that's a lie. And he'd like, be quiet. And I'm like, no, I'm not. He's up there telling a lie out loud. I'm going to speak the truth out loud. People were turning around looking at me because I'm just talking out loud in church. <laughs> and he, so one day he said, you're not going to church with me anymore. So he made me get the kids dressed and he would take them off to church and I'd be home. I was just so angry because I felt like I was losing control, but there's where God stepped in. I had to lean on him. I had to trust him. And so I would say, God, just protect their minds, protect them, Lord, bring them back to me. And because my son was, um, he was, they told me he had autism. I didn't know it at the time, but anyways, he, he could remember everything. It was incredible. Every little detail, every number, and he could quote it back to you and he'd come up from Sunday school and he started telling me everything <laughs> so this one Sunday he's gone up to church and I said Lord don't let him remember anything because they're not telling him the truth and that an hour or so later he's bursting in through the door you know church is over and they come home and he's crying and he comes over to me and he goes mommy when I was still sitting in the rocker where I was sitting when they left praying <laughs> and he comes over and he goes mommy take me out to the store right now and I said, why? And he said, I need to buy a tablet and paper because there's something wrong with my mind. I can't remember a thing that teacher said. Oh <laughs> and I was like, gosh. God, you're so amazing. And God started showing me right there. I mean, that was the first time I had a prayer answered that instant. And um, God started showing me that he was taking care of them and that he was keeping them. It was just amazing. And okay, so what, what's going on now with you and your husband? So you're not allowed to go to church because you've got a bad attitude. Yeah. <laughs> so well, that can't go on very long. About a year later, I get pregnant and I am having my fourth child. Now, my other three were born at home because we didn't go to the doctors. But um, now I'm having my fourth child and he goes and asks for a midwife because the church always gave you a midwife. She would come over. Not that she was allowed to do anything. She just sat there that if the baby was born, she would tend to it for you. Other than that, the husband had to do everything in case something bad happened. Then there was no connection to the church. You were told if something happened to the mother of the child during the birth, you were not allowed to say that there was somebody from the church there because the church oh my gosh. exempted themselves from you. You had to say that it was your choice to have the child at home. So anyways, the church refused him. They said, your wife's not coming to church. Well, he was so angry because he was still going to church and paying tithe. And they said, no, you can't have a midwife. The pastor said, he said, you get your wife back to the church and then, you know, you can't have the midwife. And um, so I, I, uh, time came near to have my baby and something was wrong. I went into labor and I was in labor for a week. And my sister came to him and said, are you going to let her die like everybody else in that church does? Because so many women in the church die in childbirth. And so there was a hospital right across the street from me. So he called my cousin. She actually was a nurse there. She had left the church and was a nurse at this hospital. So he called her. She came and took me over. They told me I had less than an hour to live. And um, what happened? What was wrong? Well, here the baby was laying transverse in me. And they had to do an emergency C-section. He had already died within me. And they shocked him back to life. And they told me he would probably not make it because unbeknown to them, they were trying to bring me out of my anesthesia and I couldn't, I couldn't come out of it. And so they were trying to shock me by telling me my baby might not make it. 
but unbeknown to them, I was worse than he was because I had never been in a hospital before. And so they had no records on me. Well, also but, too, they probably gave you so much anesthesia, but you had never before ever experienced. Well, now were you awake or were you like out? Uh, I was out and then I remember them talking to me. I could hear them, but I couldn't answer. And then I, when I did come out of it, um, they realized I was pretty bad. Uh, I was really, really sick. And I ended up being in the hospital six weeks. Well, what and, actually was wrong with you then? Uh, I, they said I had a raging infection because the baby had died in me and lost all of his bowels and everything. And so oh. when they did the emergency C-section, like his arm, what, his shoulder was where his head was supposed to be. So when I was trying to push all week, and have him it lacerated his arm it was so black and just real tiny and skinny I and his leg was so wedged into my hip bone that it was crooked it looked like an elbow macaroni and uh, they told me he may never throw a ball he would never walk straight but God healed him he's it's amazing he is now 6'3 300 pounds <laughs> oh my gosh I did oh this is this is a he, story I've never heard before and then he they told me he would never throw a ball and he played football in school and guess guess what he did? He hiked them off, he threw it. <laughs> that was his position. So God was amazing. And, uh, but they, uh, they were, they feared for him, you know, because they had to shock him back to life. But God just, he had no brain damage or anything. It was incredible. But okay, because so of that. This, did this shake up all the, the cult a little bit? Well, because I went to the hospital, my husband got kicked out of church. My, my older children would come to see me and they'd say the, the one day, my little girl, she's crying. She goes, mommy, I got in trouble at school today because I said the H word. And I said, what? And she goes, yeah. I said, what did you say? And she goes, well, I just told them you were in the hospital. And the H word was the hospital. She wasn't allowed to say it. Oh. <laughs> and she got in trouble for it. So, um, uh, then that was it. They, uh, after he's born, that when school was over, that they got out of school, and I ended up putting them in public school. And my husband came out of the church, but it took a while. It took a long while because he still had his parents and family to deal with. So and I have a question for you because we know that the trans the transformation happens by renewing your mind. So was there? How did you deal with? Um, now you've got like, God has just rocked your world, changed to everything. Like, how are you dealing with that on a daily basis of not wanting to, you know, be scared of what was, you know, the hellfire that was going to come after you versus the freedom that you were, that you were now understanding to be true. All I can say is during that time of listening to Andrew and, and, and transitioning just before I had my son. I had lost Andrew because we, when we moved, I didn't know how to find him on TV because I didn't, I didn't know anything about TV. Right. So I never heard him anymore for a long while. But uh, eventually that changed. But God had taken all that fear from me. I did not fear. As much as I feared not doing it, I was so compelled to, to follow him. Mm. I, my husband threatened me not to get any messages from him because Andrew offered free tapes. So I was telling my sister about it one day. I said, could you get them for me? She goes, Virginia, I'll get them for you. She, she said, he didn't tell me not to get them, so I'll get them and you can have them. So she'd give them to me. I'd listen, stuff them under my mattress. He never found out, but he he didn't want me getting anything, uh, uh, listening to other preachers, because that was very, very uh, simple and against the church. Right. You weren't allowed so what, so how did you, now, are you still married to Richard? Yes. Okay. And so we know you made it through. <laughs> but one day he, he threatened me. He said, if you're not out of the house by Sunday, I'm going to kill you. And so Sunday came and well, I packed my kid's suitcase, called my sister, come and get me. And, and then that voice spoke and said, don't go. And I, I only listened to that voice. So I called my sister and said, God just told me not to go. She goes, you're out of your mind. And I hope the next time I hear from you, it's not about you, it's not too late. I said, please don't come and get me. So I unpacked a kid's suitcase and I stayed. 
because I just had such confidence in that voice. I knew he would take care of me. And Sunday night came and, and I went to Colin Ben. He goes, what are you still doing here? Because he totally expected me to leave, which I was going to. And I said, well, I took a vow for better, for worse. I can't think it gets any worse. So I'm going to stick around to see how much better it gets. He didn't say already, just turned over and went to sleep. But God, God just kept him at bay. Like he would do things, but God just kept me quiet. Uh, I didn't answer. And then he actually would say, oh, look, your mother's in a zone. He'd tell the kids I was in a zone. Oh, she has that little bubble around her. And I went, wow, God, you're so amazing. Because he, he did, it was almost like he did put a bubble around me. So even though he would say abusive things or try to get me to leave, and I, I didn't go. God just kept me there for whatever reason. It was just amazing. So God just kept me there, kept growing me. Um, it just was an amazing walk. And, and eventually he started seeing, he started understanding. He still had his family um, fighting him, you know, because here's one of the things they'd say, just don't tell people what you're doing or how you believe. Just come to church at least once on a Sunday so that we can associate with you. Because that's the only way they could associate with oh, us right. if we went to church. Yeah. It doesn't matter what you do afterwards. And he goes, Mom, that's so deceitful. She goes, but everybody does it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Not your family, but maybe yeah. everybody else. I, Well, I'm sorry, but I will never stop saying what I believe. And I will never walk back in that church. And I never did, praise God. Um, there's just no way I could ever make myself. So what was it like when the world, I'm not talking about like the world system, but like the world opened up to you where you now were able to have conversations with people that were outside the church that you were able now to pray for people openly. I mean, how did I couldn't function at work? first when I, when I first put my children in public school, I, I would walk them to school and the mothers would all be standing there talking. And then after the school bell rang, the kids went in. They'd stand there and continue talking. Well, I would turn my back to them, but I would stay there and listen because I didn't know how to communicate. I, I would listen to what they talked about and how they acted and what they said because I didn't know how to act out there. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. It was a whole new world. So it took me quite a while. Was your hair still extremely long and no makeup? Yeah. And no so, yes. Yeah. Like wrap your, this is such a girl thing, but did you wrap your hair like in a bun? Like how did you, how did you yeah. not? That's your hair. We always had to pull it back and braid it and wear it up in a bun. Um, but sometimes I would just pull it back in a ponytail. Now I could let it hang. But it, it was probably about two years after I was out that I finally, I because I, I wouldn't do anything that God didn't tell me. So I couldn't find or understand why we had to wear dresses. I just knew the scripture that they said that the woman's not to wear anything pertaining to a man, but it wasn't something in the old Testament. But when the Lord set me free, it was probably about two years later, but I was sitting on the couch one evening and I was just reading. And all of a sudden I'm, I'm reading where he said, there's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male or female. And boom, God just exploded that scripture to me. And I was like, wow. God, we're just his children. It's, he doesn't see us as a male or a female. He just sees us as his children. And, and that's when God set me free on that one too, that it wasn't about what I wore. It was about my heart. Uh, it was just so, I just can't explain to you what happened that day on the couch. It, it was just amazing because he didn't just expound that scripture to me. He just kept on talking to me. <laughs> And and other scriptures started going through my head. And I'm like, oh my goodness, it's it's about me just being his child. He looks at the heart only and not on the outward appearance. And it wasn't until a long time later, God added another scripture to me in Colossians 2, where he said he cut off our flesh at the cross. We were circumcised. And he just gave me another whole picture so that if the flesh is cut off, that's why we our sins are forgiven. We don't, we don't deal with anymore. They're buried in the deepest sea. He showed me that through that, it's just him. Yeah. This is the spirit. He, he says, I am the head, the deity. Oh, oh it was just so life-changing. It, it just really was. And, oh and therefore it wasn't about how I looked. 
not that I would do anything that would displease him. It, it wasn't about any of that at all that would got me into heaven or not. It was giving my heart to him and let becoming Christ like. So uh you're so your has so how long did it take your husband to start, you know, to start letting himself go as far as all the the religious, you know, it took a lot of years. It took a lot of years. So many people say to me, why are you only now out here 20 some years later? Why are you only, why did it take you that long? I said there was a lot of obstacles. Right. And years ago I begged my husband I wanted to come out here and it didn't work but God was working in him and when I surrendered that to the Lord I came to the point where I never go there it's okay because I have you and I can listen to Andrew I can get all this on online and then God just whoop, he just moved him and he just it was just amazing and this year oh. he said oh now when you say moving here, you mean up in Woodland Park, Colorado, to be at Karis Bible College. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. He's, so now, have you been through the school? Have you yeah, done? Just finished my first year. And nice. How about your husband? Uh, no, he hasn't gone. He says he'll never go. But when you say never, <laughs> I said, oh, honey, your, your God has something different for you. <laughs> well, but at least he's there. Yes. Yeah. So you're saying that. Okay, you said there was lots of transition that happened, but are you saying just for you though, that you were like, the minute you saw freedom, the minute you saw the love of the father, you just like dove in and you didn't have to deal with any of the other stuff anymore. Like what was, was there any more repercussions from that? Like how did oh, you know telling your kids? I, I got shunned. I, my family just shut me off completely. Um, and then there was a, one of my sisters, she never married, and she would let me come to her house and when I would come to visit, because I now lived uh, right outside of Philadelphia, which was two hours away, because they live west of Harrisburg. And so I would come up to her, her place with my children, and we'd visit. And then I, my other sister lived in West Virginia. She'd visit with me, and, and she'd eat with me, but she was very cautious. But... God was working in all of all of them and he brought them all out or saved them. And it's just oh been incredible. God, all but my oldest sister, my youngest brother, they're still in there. They're still in there. So they don't yeah. associate with you. My oldest sister won't. If I call her, she'll talk to me, but she won't associate with me. She won't eat with me or anything like that. Now, my younger brother, he started coming to the family picnics we had and he, he would eat and he would talk and everything, but they just still keep their distance from me because I was to them very rebellious. I was the black sheep. Um, you know, I just was a troublemaker. <laughs> but God's amazing. And you I the German one. <laughs> yeah. Well, two of my my one older sister, she had left before I did, but we weren't allowed to associate with her and she would talk to me. And I believe it was because of them talking to me, put even more cracks in my wall so that when God started showing himself to me, I was able to receive it. I right. believe it was them a lot because they talked a lot to me about Jesus. And so now, what, when, what about your kids? How, what happened with your children? Because you obviously, they they had to come out of that as well. Yeah, my, my children, um, they all, well, they had to go through public school. Um, now my oldest son and daughter, they, I'm not sure where they stand with the Lord. My oldest daughter, she used to be in a youth group and everything. Um, then she went to college. <laughs> so, um, I think that made a difference in her life, but I know the Lord's reaching her heart, uh, to, to accept him and trust him. She's married. Um, and my oldest son, he's still single, but he, he never um, got baptized either or gave himself to the Lord, that, but he has a heart for the Lord. Right. He really, he's very, uh, uh, he and I talk about the Lord a lot on the phone. And, oh, great. So well, I just know. I know that with, with you, I'm sure, you know, your, your mother's heart cry is that they will know the truth about the Lord. And I understand how a lot of times when they come out of these situations, they're like, I want nothing to do with that. But the the love of the father just draws them in. At some Absolutely. point in their life, they get drawn in because you can't 
you know, there's no defense against love. Like love is powerful and it's strong. And yes. But it did for us, right? For God yeah. to love the world that he gave. And if he gave you a TV that didn't work, that had Andrew come on it. <laughs> I know There's that's nothing that won't that that he won't put in front of your friends and family that are still in that kind of a of a walk. So, yeah. is there anything else that you would like to add that I don't know of? I don't even know to even ask you. Um, well, I don't like to add. I don't know, but I do want to say this: my third daughter, she got baptized, and she is here. She went through first year with me at Karis. Oh, she's, yay. yes, it's, she's still in third year. And uh, and my youngest son, he's here too with us. He's staying here with us. That's awesome. Yeah, and I'm believing he will be attending Karis one of these days too. Now, how old, how old is he now? He's 19. Okay, so your youngest is 19. Well, yes. again, is there something that you'd like to say that, you know, because a lot of people out there are bound in, maybe they're not like in such a cult like you were that, that was so ridiculous, but like they still are at a, a, a church where they're teaching the condemnation, they're teaching that you're going to hell, they're teaching that God punishes you through sickness and disease. And, you know, if you, if you, if you choose to be a Christian, then, you know, you're being punished for that. Or, you know, um, I heard one the other day that was pretty bad too, that it's an honor to be sick, which I don't understand that. So is there anything that you can reach out and say to people that are watching this, that they can even share with friends and family, or it's them themselves that are going through something like this, that you could help them be free. Well, one thing that I've discovered a lot of people still have fear of walking away and they live in their past you jesus said if we put our hand to the plow and look back we're not fit for the kingdom of heaven and i don't believe he means that we can't be saved or, or you know get to heaven i believe he means we aren't effective and our past traps us and i just heard something that was very interesting it says the wake of a boat does not propel it forward it doesn't propel it anywhere it has nothing to do with it and that's our past only if we turn back into it if you turn that boat around and go back into that wave behind you it will then rock your boat and it could capsize it or do whatever and that's what too many people do they turn around and look back i believe we need to keep our eyes on the cross keep looking forward and gone ahead because it's only there that you find true freedom and victory and lose your fear and find peace in Christ and the grace that will pull you through. It's just, it's just amazing. I have met so many who have, and still are trapped, like you said, in that mindset of my past, it should not be defining you right now. It, your past does not define you. Your past does not affect tomorrow. Only if you let it, only if you turn back and look at it, only if you turn that boat around and go back into that wave. Other than that, it can't propel you anywhere. It can't affect you. It can't rock your boat. So we have to just turn everything to God and just embrace the newness he's given us, the new life. We can't mix the two. So our past needs to be done. Fear needs to be gone. And um, and he will do it for you. He just will. I, I just know because I've experienced that. He will do that supernatural when you, and he knows you want to move on with him rather than live in the past. You cannot hold on to your past and walk in your new. And he will expose those lies. It's, it's, um, it's heartbreaking when I meet women or, men who are just so still troubled by their past and say, well, this is what I was taught. This is what I heard. It just cripples you and it'll keep you stagnant. It'll keep you right there in that spot. But if we can just say, Hey, my life starts at the cross. And that's what I'm learning. Even out here in Karis, I had lies exposed that were still in there that I didn't realize I was still believing. 
and the truth will set you free. I mean, if you think about it, it was in the, that's how your heart was like, made, like it was in your DNA because that's Absolutely. all you, right? It, it, that's, right. it's like, if you became someone else tomorrow, like you'd still have, you know, your, your personality and, you know, yeah. the fabric of your heart is still what it was. And man, that's just amazing. I have one quick question. When sure. what, what was it like to cut your hair and put makeup on one day? <laughs> <laughs> that fun or what? <laughs> well, the first time. And it, it, you know, it was so funny. God used my husband to always do that. I never asked for my hair to be cut. He come home one day and said, here, I, here's a gift certificate. I want you to go and get your hair cut. Isn't that amazing? Oh my and God. Yet, yet if I visited my sister after I found the Lord and I had come out, he would always measure my hair when I come home to see if I got it trimmed. If I went to her place and, and got it cut because he, he didn't want me to sin. <laughs> he, he accused me, make me drop my hair down to see if, if I had cut it. And now here he is sending me to get it cut. Um, when I saw all the hair on the floor, I was so jolted. I, and then every, I looked in the mirror, I cried the whole way home. It wasn't joyous. I, I was so, I was so scared. And, and then I didn't know who I was. I did not see me. So it, it took a little while to get used to that. I bet. What about wearing makeup and getting uh, your nails done? Yeah, I never had my nails done. I. <laughs> <laughs> okay, when I come to Woodland Park, can I please take you out and get your nails? Sure. <laughs> We're gonna get our nails done, okay? And makeup, I did start. I did start wearing that very uh, subtly. Not that was fun. I enjoyed doing that. I still don't know how to do it properly. I'm sure, but <laughs> it was it was fun. And, and the last thing I want to ask you was, how was that transition of Virginia? You don't think that way anymore. You know when you were to do whatever, something that was like getting your hair cut or putting a, some makeup on or, you know, wearing an outfit that wasn't, you know, appropriate for what the, the cult wanted you to wear. Was there times where you had to tell yourself, no, Virginia, we don't live like that anymore. Like, that's not me. Uh, yes, they're in the beginning. But as time went on, it was so freeing. It was so amazing. I, it's almost like I don't have words to describe the feeling the freedom of, of being able to just walk to your closet and put on a pair of pants. Oh, that's right. Cause you had to wear dresses. Yeah. Yeah. And to what just about, have, what about high heels? No. I, now I wasn't now girls in the church wore them, but I was never allowed. Never. Okay. And so the first time, <laughs> trust me, <laughs> I had the spikes. I loved them. Uh, just, just exciting. To be able to do something I couldn't do and know that it wasn't wrong and that God wasn't going to punish me or beat me up. Now, did you have to tell yourself that when, because I, I hear that a lot in other, in other ways, not just in like you being raised in this cult, but like where you're saying like, it's okay. I can wear, like, I'm not going to get condemned for this. Like God, I can wear this. I can, you know, wear colors. I can put things in my hair or whatever. I can put curls in my hair. The first, the first thing, uh, the hardest thing was getting my hair cut. I had to tell myself that it didn't matter that, that, you know, because you almost felt like, like you were just a prostitute or something, <laughs> you know? Yeah. That's just how I felt. I felt naked. And so, yeah, that one I had to, um, get over, but some of the other things, as I was walking with the Lord, he just was setting me free and I didn't realize it so that it wasn't a hurdle for me. Some things I could just do like the shoes. I just wanted that, you know, so that was exciting. I didn't have to talk myself into that. Um, pants. I was good with it. Unless I saw somebody from the church, then I had a little bit of problem. I didn't want them to see me because you still had that uh, consciousness of what they were going to say about you. You were right. so trying everybody was looking at you so you you had to uh that was a big hurdle of mine to get over what other people thought of me and what they would say about me because you were always condemned and now you only care about what god says about you absolutely but the re the truth of what god says not not yeah. the, the fake version of it and who i am and it's just so freeing and i just want everyone to walk in that 
you know, I not the best. It hurts me when I still see these women um, struggling in their religion, and you just want them to have that same freedom in Christ. There's just nothing like it. Well, and I just um, now are you starting any kind of a ministry or something that is going to help or? You've got a, an online something where you're helping women with this. I don't have anything online right now, or I haven't had anything, but my heart is to help hurting women to uh, open up my home, to take them in, to do whatever. That has been a dream of mine since 2015, to, to talk to them, help them. I do talk to a lot of women. Like I'm on the I'm sure you do. Right so now. you were completely out of all this at, in 2015 or when did it all end? Oh, I, yeah, absolutely. By 2015, I, I was very free. <laughs> uh, in fact, that's when I was really asking my husband to come out here. Uh, but it took a while. You okay. know, God had to work in his heart. And but, he's here now. So that's yeah. awesome. Yes. Well, and thank I've, so much you you have done you've what you've talked about here has been so freeing for a lot of people i know it so if you're watching and you know anybody that's in some kind of a cult weird religion a religion of man any of those things being you know their their pastors or dictators you know please share this because this is a real thing it's very it's weird it's odd it's terrible but god is the one that loves you more than anything he'll take you as you are <laughs> And they'll yeah. clean you up and turn you around and make you such an amazing person. So I just thank you guys for watching. I thank you, Virginia, also for just being such a an open vessel to let people know, uh, you know, because a lot of things that we talked about are like, you know, personal things. But, you know, the, sometimes that's where people get shocked the most into saying, wow, that actually is me and I need to change that now. So just, I want to thank you. I want to thank Andrew Womack Ministries because of him, oh, you wouldn't be today talking about this or you would have, but it just maybe would have taken a little bit longer. So go to our website at healingjourneystoday.com and check out everything that we have there. We have newsletters. We always have great things happening. And you can also email us as well if you have any questions about anything. And so I'm so excited for you all to, to watch these last uh, interviews. They were really awesome. And thank you so much, Virginia. And we will see you next time on the journey. Bye-bye. Thank you, Julian. Bye-bye.